Hello and welcome to another episode of Virtual Legality. I'm your host, Richard Hogue, managing member of the Hogue Law Business Law Firm of Northville, Michigan, and we are on the back half of Epic versus Apple, people. We're on day eight of testimony. If you haven't been following along with us, we've got a couple of now pretty long playlists, 41 episodes, soon to be 42, in an antitrust epic going all the way back to the beginning of the mega drop last fall, and now the shorter but still pretty lengthy Playlist Epic versus Apple, just the trial if you're only interested in these kind of long form bites of, well, the Apple, as it were, and the testimony that's happening in the litigation. Now, before we get started with yesterday's testimony, today's video, we generally look over some of the things that have happened around the litigation and not just within it. To which we bring up on our screen a games industry biz article talking about something that we mentioned a couple of videos back. And that was that Apple was trying to get the testimony of Lori Wright, vice president of Xbox, stricken, reduced in credibility so that the judge doesn't have to consider it quite as much on the premise that Microsoft didn't provide the documentation that was requested by Apple and the court. And that Ms. Wright in her testimony testified as to things that Apple didn't have proper evidentiary backing from the other party to review and or cross-examine. Well, as of yesterday, the court has said, all right, Epic, Microsoft, give us motions talking about what Apple has requested here. Epic has now, as of yesterday, opposed Apple's motion. In court documents seen by Games Industry Biz, the Fortnite firm sent several exhibits in an attempt to back up Wright's testimony. This included two documents it has received from Microsoft, although it is not clear what these contained as they are only available to the court. Epic's filing even included a proposed order denying Apple's request for an adverse credibility finding, which it hopes Judge Gonzalez Rogers will sign. And that's actually Epic's normal modus operandi here. When they filed their initial documents and certainly their preliminary injunction request, they actually write the injunction out and say, court, all you have to do is sign this and we win. Bob's your uncle. So that's not unusual for them. It doesn't mean they'll win this motion necessarily. And it's interesting because part of Apple's complaint is that Lori Wright was testifying as to things that Apple wasn't able to ascertain from the documents, which meant that their cross-examination was ineffective for this purpose. So because this kind of motion timeline goes after the purported end date of this trial, I think it ends on May 24th, according to the court right now, then Apple still has an argument, even if Epic can provide documentation to the court that backs up what Lori Wright said, because cross-examination is an entitlement of the defense. And if they weren't properly able to cross-examine those documents through that testimony, there might still be some kind of effectiveness for that motion. It'll be interesting to see how that turns out. Again, because this is a bench trial, because the judge has heard what she has heard, because she's getting all these documents that we don't get to see on the outside, this motion is a little bit angels on the head of a pin, a little bit just Apple trying to explain that they think that that testimony should be discounted when the judge, as a bench trial, is making her final determination. And that's really all that happened behind the scenes at the trial. The court has clearly gotten a handle on keeping the non-disclosed information, non-disclosed on sealing the things that are appropriate after a fairly rough first week of, admittedly, very, very interesting leaks to those of us that follow the gaming industry on the outside here. But now we're in the battle of the experts. We're now two days deep into this. If you don't know, if you're just jumping in on day eight for some reason because you thought the thumbnail was provocative or what have you, we are now talking about economics and economists from both sides paid money by either side to effectively back up their theory of what's happening here for antitrust purposes. We're going to start the day in cross-examination of Susan Athey, which is one of Epic's economic experts. And then we're going to move on to not one, not two, but three of Apple's economic experts, including cross-examination of those experts by Epic, with the exception of the last, which will come in a future video when they get that cross-examination done. And so we will start to see this battle of the experts. And as we've talked about in this series, both in its long form and in just the trial, 
This is one of those muddy areas that you really do feel for a judge. You feel for the justice system because the Sherman Antitrust Act and United States antitrust competition jurisprudence is so vague and so ambiguous as applied to any specific business model. You're always going to be able to have folks with really, really good degrees and really, really good backgrounds in economics and professorship and research, essentially shouting at each other and saying the opposite thing and saying, judge, you figure it out. Uh, And that's unfortunately as expected, what we will see as part of this process. So this is Addie Robertson from The Verge. Once again, my thanks to Ms. Robertson, The Verge, Tom Warren, Nick Stott, a whole other host of people that are live tweeting and commenting on this because that's what makes these virtual legality episodes possible. T minus 10 until day eight of Epic versus Apple. More testimony from Epic expert witness Susan Athey, then Apple's first experts, Richard Shamalenzi, and possibly Francine LaFontaine. We actually hit a fourth one in Mr. Hit, I believe. Yesterday's stuff below where they summarize it at The Verge. You can absolutely check that out, but let's get into it. We're on the stand with Apple's cross-examination of Athy. Apple is asking about Steam's iOS app where people can buy games, but not iOS games, and Steam wallet funds. Apple is also citing Steam Link, which lets you stream games from a PC to the iOS, quoting an actual tweet that Steam put out there. The Steam Link app is available now for free on iOS, Apple TV. The app allows gamers to stream their Steam library to their iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV. Apple Lawyer is implicitly criticizing Athy for not mentioning Steam as a cross-platform iOS gaming option. There's no place where you say Steam has apps in the App Store, correct? Athy says she'd need to double-check the report. Always the right answer if you don't know something in court under oath. You say, I don't recall, and perhaps I could refresh my recollection by looking at some documentation and paperwork, et cetera, et cetera. Apple, do you have any idea how many times a day Steam Link is downloaded? Lawyer is citing what appears to be this Sensor Tower report, which is a journalistic outlet reporting specifically on the iOS and mobile ecosystems, which says it was downloaded 52,000 times a day in its first week. Not being discussed right now, as Ms. Robertson puts it, but Apple has effectively drawn a distinction between cloud gaming like xCloud and streaming from a specific PC. Tom Warren notes that this has caused some confusion on the App Store. And indeed, across the industry, the definitions here aren't great because you're actually streaming a broadcast of something and whether or not it's operating on your personal computer or a remote server isn't well handled in the App Store guidelines because Apple continues to kind of reflect the business models that it is approached with and change its rules, not necessarily on an anti-competitive basis, but maybe depending on which side of the spectrum you fall on this particular question in order to address different kinds of business models. So xCloud and GeForce Now are prohibited under their streaming rules, whereas a Steam Link, which is still streaming, but from your personal computer rather than a remote server, is allowed under those same rules. Apple also cites remote play options from PlayStation and Xbox. Again, worth noting that these are specifically about streaming from a console rather than pure cloud gaming. Apple brings up Game Club, which it describes as a cross-platform competitor to Apple Arcade. Athy said that there was unnecessary friction there, but Apple is asking her if she's actually measured the effect of friction, and I didn't perform that specifically for this case. As a refresher, Athy spent a lot of yesterday talking about high costs and friction in switching between iOS and Android. Apple's rebutting this by highlighting third-party multi-game services that work across both platforms. And these distinctions are all, as a side note, again, Ms. Robertson here, sort of a muddle. Apple and Epic arguing across a bunch of different axes about whether GeForce Now is different from Steam Link and Apple Arcade is different from Roblox and how Apple's app store should treat all these services. Last week, Apple emphasized that it needed to lock down certain services. Here, it's focusing on the opposite, showing services it does allow and saying the friction involved in reaching them is negligible, which is a long way of saying that this start of cross-examination on day eight is really talking about the fact that Apple, again, this is their defense, allows competitors to their gaming ecosystem. Yes, they make a lot of money on games, but they have specific rules for specific reasons. And as we've talked about in this series, I think their reasoning behind prohibiting GeForce Now and xCloud is particularly poor, that they don't make a great case on that particular axis. And Microsoft or NVIDIA would have probably been a more effective plaintiff in this case. But they do say, hey, we've got all these other options. And they can also point to what? Their Safari browser. And yes, there's restrictions on that. We'll talk about that a little bit as part of this video. But it's worth noting that 
that xCloud and Microsoft is exploring going directly through the browser rather than the App Store right now. And that, as of this moment in time, is what Apple allows and in fact suggests to Microsoft and in the top of their app developer guidelines for the App Store says, hey, you can always go through Safari. It's right in the opening paragraph of that guideline document, which adds a little bit of intrigue, right? You've got Aaron Greenberg at Microsoft with a tweet yesterday during the same day of testimony saying, I'm loving playing Xbox Game Pass games on the go with the backbone. It basically turns your iPhone into an Xbox portable system like the Switch. And indeed it does. It looks very cool. Uh, It's got kind of a back thing here where you put your iPhone and it's got the controllers on either side. And because of the way that they're working with the browser and Game Pass and xCloud, it allows you to play Xbox games on your iPhone. It just doesn't go through the App Store, which if I'm Apple, I'm presenting as there are substitutes and options and possibilities for people to get access to our user base and our market that don't go through the App Store. They just have to figure out a different way to do it. So we talked about earlier in the series that maybe doesn't give a lot of comfort to the Microsofts and the NVIDIAs of the world since Apple does change its rules and reserves the right to change those rules at basically any time. But as of right this moment, you've got tweets out here like Aaron Greenberg in the middle of this litigation saying, hey, we can get our stuff on iPhone friction-free. And of course, it's not friction-free as Microsoft and Epic have both argued, but it certainly looks nice in a tweet like this one. Continuing with with Miss Athy's testimony, Uh, As a refresher, Athey spent a lot of yesterday talking about the high cost and friction. We already mentioned that. And now Epic's lawyer is coming back up. So this is now direct testimony. Athey is an Epic witness. And we're going back to Game Club and its iOS service. Do you remember from your report whether Game Cloud's entry into iOS was smooth? Athey says no. It was rejected more than 100 times and it can offer only certain games. Athey says Game Club was only approved with contractual restrictions saying it can't offer third-party games. So Game Club is not a great answer, says Epic back to Apple. You're restricting these things because you are protecting your competitive advantage in games distribution. And again, I don't think that Apple's not doing that necessarily. I just think that Epic's theory of a monopoly on these restrictions probably isn't the right way to go. When was the last time Microsoft was your primary consulting client? Again, asking Ms. Athey. It was scaling down in 2015, Athey says. And did Epic hiring you have anything to do with Microsoft? Not as far as I know, Athey says. Again, that's not an appropriate question for this witness. But that's fine. She doesn't know. It's A-OK. And this is important because, again, yesterday, Apple was trying to discount this testimony by suggesting that Epic hired someone that it knew couldn't look at Apple documentation because the court would prevent it because she worked for a competitor, a direct competitor of Apple, and that she was then basing her expert testimony on things that she wouldn't ordinarily base it on, essentially kind of a hearsay type defense. Epic comes in and says, you haven't worked for Microsoft for eons, right? At least in tech world, 2015 might as well be 1015. And she says, no, haven't worked for them for a long time. And Epic didn't hire me due to my connection with Microsoft. That's not something she would know. But again, it's pretty effective trying to defend against that line of Apple's attack. Then we get into this piracy question. If you recall from yesterday, one of the things that Apple attacked her on was saying, you didn't account for the security features. Apple is trying to sell that one of the things that it does with its 30% with the sales of its entire iOS ecosystem is advertise to people that it's more secure than alternatives. And you didn't account for that because you didn't account for things like piracy of video games. Epic's lawyer questions whether the article actually says Android piracy is worse than iOS piracy. And this is Miss Athy. I think it's suggesting that piracy may be more common, but also that people who have less money to spend might be substituting between piracy and not using the game at all rather than piracy and paying. So although piracy is more common, it doesn't necessarily mean fixing the piracy would make developers earn more, which is an interesting axis. And certainly in my comments, across Reddit, the internet, wherever else you might find it, you will see people defending video game piracy on this premise that uh, those people weren't going to buy it anyway, which means that developers in this thesis aren't harmed by the existence of piracy because they wouldn't have made that money anyway. And that's kind of odd for a company that sells video games and engine licenses and operates a storefront to actually operate on. Piracy's not so bad in this testimony, and that's that's unusual. Now, Apple, who doesn't get to cross-examine again here, this is redirect testimony, 
would probably say to this that piracy is only one axis, developer benefits is only one axis, that piracy as a mode, as a quality of a platform encourages other things that are bad, that piracy, if you have that open platform, if it is evidenced by piracy, is suggestive of the fact that you can get more malicious code and very bad things and hurts your overall security statement. The advertising that you want to go out with, that you are a more secure environment than others, but it's still an interesting axis on which Miss Athy is questioned. And she is done. So she went over day seven and day eight. And now we start to get into the parade of Apple experts. In fact, this thumbnail before I arrived at the liquor store picture was almost a mention of Apple joining this battle of experts. As we've promised, we're now going to get people with other credentials shouting the exact opposite thing in court. And whether or not Epic can effectively poke holes in this is an open question and one that we won't have answered until we get the judge's final opinion on this case on the whole. At the stepping down, we are getting our next witness, this time from Apple's side, Richard Shalmanisi, who Nick Stat notes also testified for Microsoft at its big antitrust trial, defending uh, Microsoft, presumably in that kind of uh, description. And that's pretty old. And as we've talked about, is not a great analog to what we're talking about today, where you've got one provider of hardware and an operating system that operates specifically on that hardware versus Microsoft in the 90s selling software into other hardware markets and trying in many respects to control what those third parties were doing when Apple just wants to control its own walled garden. So it's not a great analog, but it is interesting. I'm also almost certain to butcher the pronunciation of Shamalensi a number of times, so I apologize in advance. Uh, Richard, if you're watching this, I am going to do my very, very best. Shama Lindsay and yesterday's epic witness David Evans have collaborated in the past, but they're on different sides today, and Shama Lindsay is specifically here to rebut Evans' claims. Evan was there to argue that Apple has a monopoly on the iOS ecosystem and is using it to levy an unfair fee on in-app purchases, among other things. Shama Lindsay characterizes iOS as part of a hardware-software bundle rather than the distinct market Apple can monopolize. And if you take nothing else away from this battle of the experts, the last three days, maybe even the entire playlist here, the thing you should take away is that Epic's notion of this case is that the App Store and then under it, in-app payment processing are all separate markets from selling an iPhone. And that people go and they buy an iPhone and then they decide to engage with the App Store. And then if they're engaged in the App Store and they've got a copy of Fortnite, Then they decide to engage with V-Bucks and Apple and their experts would take the opposite approach and tells the court, no, when you're standing there in the Best Buy or wherever you might be standing, deciding on what phone to buy, you are thinking about the app store, the universe of apps, what in-app payment processing might be. And you're not actually thinking about that, which is another of Apple's defenses in all honesty, but that you are thinking about the holistic universe of what this thing is. It's not a phone and then an OS. It's a phone and OS. Shama Lindsay characterizes iOS as part of a hardware software bundle rather than a distinct market Apple can monopolize. They don't monopolize an iOS market. They're not going out to an iOS customer base. They're selling the entire thing altogether. They're not just selling their operating system. They're certainly not just selling their app store and they're not selling in-app payment processing. Now, it is no surprise to those of you that have been following this from the beginning that I think this is the stronger case. And that's not just because I think it's the more obvious one, that I think that this is, in fact, a better description of the reality of when someone decides to buy an iPhone. It's also historically the way devices have been thought of. And yes, software is pretty young in the world of law, where law basically takes 100 years to acknowledge changes in technology and exactly how they should be addressed in things like antitrust and competition frameworks. But... In both cases, I think this is a stronger argument than there is a distinct market for what Apple already controls, that it's not relevant that Apple is the only provider of iOS because iOS is only designed to run this iPhone and they're not the only provider of mobile phones. But that's going to be the fight that happens in court and will ultimately determine by the final decision of this judge and then almost certainly the Court of Appeals and who knows, maybe the Supreme Court. He then describes the commission structure. Right? He says, it's a commission charged by Apple as part of its pricing strategy. It's not payment processing alone. And here's another area where I think this is basically a better description of reality. Epic wants to say that it's just PayPal or Stripe or Visa and MasterCard, and it's not. 
And the judge has essentially rejected the notions that Epic has given that it is only those payment processing things in her temporary restraining order comments, in her preliminary injunction comments, where she said, well, certainly Apple is giving you access to its proprietary technology. It's giving you access to its audience. That earns something in return, doesn't it? And so I do think that Apple probably has a leg up on this kind of axis of the economic discussion just to start. Sean Malenzi also disputes Evans' claim that you can separate in-app payment processing as its own market. Does it describe a plausible market in your opinion? It does not. Is Apple's IIP system synonymous with payment processing services? Well, the closest analog I can come up with in the brick and mortar world is it's like the credit card terminal. It connects to a payment processor. IAP is the essential way that Apple collects its commissions. This is how Apple, in an automatic and seamless fashion, collects the commissions it's owed, Shamalenzi says. Developers have a desire not to pay a commission, not a demand for an alternative service. Shamalenzi says he can't think of a single successful platform that asked for a commission and then made it very easy for people to avoid it. In an online business of this kind, the commission model is a natural way to monetize. In larger transactions, the store makes more money, the seller makes more money, so the percentage commission seems very natural. And we've talked about that. In general, a percentage commission for a retail type relationship makes sense. You want both sides to be aiming their boat in the same direction and rowing in that same direction. And in general, a percentage-based commission says, you make more money, I make more money. You make less money, I make less money. We both have incentives to make as much money as possible, and that works. That's what Sean Malenzi is saying here. He's also saying, however, that it's the credit card processing terminal on the counter of your digital GameStop, on the counter of your ephemeral Best Buy, and that it's collecting the commission because, as we've also talked about, where the money goes matters. In any contractual relationship, you want to be in charge of the customer's money coming in so that you can take your cut and then pass it along. Because the alternative is that you have to trust the documentation from the other party, get your cut back out, and then potentially have to audit their records if they are otherwise trying to skim off the top and those kinds of things. So Apple, in charge of its proprietary technology and access to its app store, says, we'll take our cut first and then we'll pass along the 70% to you. And that's all well and good, although it does get itself in some trouble in certain antitrust capacities, as we are also seeing in the consumer disputes against Apple, and maybe we'll do videos on those when they finally make it to court, but it makes sense in a purely competitive framework. We want to make sure we get our money. We don't want to pay for audits, and we're not trying to be anti-competitive in this methodology. That's Apple's stance, of course. Shamalenzi draws a comparison to American Express, which had anti-steering rules, rules against telling people how to get around fees, and he compares it to Apple's model. Amex prevailed in a big court case about this, notably. In Amex, there wasn't a duopoly though, correct? The judge asks. When you're going to a store, you can see the store that says Visa, MasterCard, Discover, Amex, so there were visual indications of options. Visual indications of options don't exist in this circumstance. Shamalenzi says the important thing is that, to continue the analogy, merchants can't say to the customers, I'd really rather you didn't use the Amex card. Could you use the Visa? Judge asks, well, what's so bad about it anyway to have consumers have the choice? The reason is if consumers have choice, if the app vendor can say, if you press this button, you can buy this for less, that means the app store can't collect its commission. You're undercutting its revenue stream. And I don't think it's factually the same, the judge says. Judge is not buying any of this analogy, even though... Mr. Shamalensi has arrived at the same place that he started, which is that you shouldn't be allowed to steer away from the store because then that's all you would be doing. And if the store and the ecosystem and what Apple has built is to have any value, you can't just allow an off-ramp. You can't just allow folks to say, oh, buy it here cheaper. And maybe that's good enough. Maybe it's not. Again, the judge seems to be signaling that she is thinking pretty strongly about this anti-steering provision that we will take a look at in the guidelines as part of this video. Shamalenzi also says Evans neglected indirect network effects that magnify the impact of a price change. Some elaboration on what that means from written testimony below. I'm not going to read that written testimony because I don't think it's helpful or terribly clarifying. Suffice it to say what Shamalenzi is alleging with respect to Evans saying that Apple could increase its prices and not a lot of people would leave, is that if the network effects are going to be used against Apple to suggest that there's an additional lock-in just based on the nature of the product itself, then those should also be taken into account when you're doing your analysis of what a price increase would do and what the effect of even a small number of folks leaving would have. That there's a multiplier on both ends and that Evans essentially neglected to apply it 
to the fact that only a few people would leave on this specific increase in price, but that would have a larger effect than he's otherwise giving it credit for because of the nature of the product. Now, do I agree with that? Do I believe that? I'm not so sure, but it is an attempted defense. There's a feedback effect, as he says. If even small numbers of developers and consumers respond to price increases, others follow because of network effects, and it shifts the overall power balance. As I said, that's the stuff that's missing. Also, the app store's allegedly very high operating margin also isn't an indicator of profit margins either, Shamalenzi says. Shamalenzi analogizes two factories, one invested in machines and one worker, although has lots of employees and no machines. The first would show a higher operating margin, but that doesn't mean it's more profitable since they spent lots of money up front on the machines. They spent capital at the front end. In this analogy, Apple invested a bunch of money into building iPhones and iOS, and you should treat that partially as Apple spending on the App Store. There's simply no economically meaningful way to allocate joint costs among several products and services. And broadly speaking, I think that's right. Certainly, if you've got that additional capital that you've expended on selling hardware, then that can be something that you could judge against the profitability and the operating margin and, and what is or is not anti-competitive in terms of the money that a company makes. Related question, Sean Malenci has asked if there are implications for other app stores. He says there are a number of online app stores that similarly require using their own payment systems, previously mentioned Xbox, PlayStation, Switch, Android, and others. Sean Malenci says an Apple loss would create an incentive to simply not allow third-party apps at all to keep control of your platform. And this is Apple hitting on what we've talked about now for a week or more, which is that Epic wants to say none of what it's asking for will affect any of these other ecosystems because the judge has already indicated that she is sensitive to that particular line of argument. And Apple coming in, noting that sensitivity and saying, uh-uh, it's going to affect all of these other things. And then as we talked about yesterday, with Epic's own expert, there is a notion that Epic would suggest that it's more competitive to not have an app store at all, to not allow third-party developers access to your platform and your eyeballs and your ecosystem entirely. Now, Epic doesn't think that's a legitimate kind of complaint. As we follow here, moving into cross-examination, Epic's lawyer wants to elaborate on this issue. Is Shamalensi saying a new entrant to the phone market would look at an Apple loss and decide not to allow third-party apps? I didn't say it would necessarily be the decision, but the thought of allowing third-party apps and then having to change business models if it became powerful enough would discourage allowing the apps, Shamalensi says. Is it inevitable? No. And it might also encourage even tighter restrictions on who can participate and very much more specific restrictions on what can participate in that platform. And again, as I said yesterday, the question has to be from the court's perspective, is that a good thing for consumer welfare? The antitrust laws are premised on this notion, not of protecting developer X, not on protecting whatever developers Epic wants to bring up in front of this litigation, but instead on the end user consumer who may or may not see a benefit to a number of different stores and a lower cost and more development and more apps and games and what have you, may or may not do that. But if you've got now this legal notion that maybe these phones shouldn't be providing that access at all and they should just be completely walled gardens, then does that benefit the consumer? And I think the obvious answer to that is no, which is why you see Epic fighting against it, saying, hey, you don't actually think people would not support app stores when they could make money through them, do you? And the answer is, uh, I don't know, says the expert. I wouldn't say that would necessarily be the decision more specifically, but it could. We're going back to the anti-steering provisions and delving into exactly what Apple's policies ban. In this case, talking about Apple not allowing targeted emails notifying users of cheaper payment options, targeted emails using data collected from the apps within the ecosystem. And I think now's a good time to talk about what that anti-steering provision actually looks like, because this seems to be the area of most vulnerability on Apple's side, just based on what the judge has commented on so far. So this is 3.1.1. If you want to unlock features or functionality within your app, you must use in-app purchase. That's what Epic wants gone. Apps may not use their own mechanisms to unlock content or functionality such as license keys, augmented reality markers, QR codes, etc. I always hate to see etc. in legal documents. Apps and their metadata may not include buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase. That's the sentence that I really do think that Apple has some vulnerability on based on what the judge has interjected so far. Apps and their metadata, the type, the descriptions, things within them, can't include buttons, external links, or other calls to action that direct customers to purchasing mechanisms other than in-app purchase. And 
a number of you came into my comments yesterday and said, well, if she got rid of that, couldn't they just advertise around it? And wouldn't that be a big problem for Apple? And it's possible. It's possible that the judge decides to say, okay, I'm not going to give you a win epic on the biggest stuff that you're asking for, app store access, side loading, app stores, that kind of thing. But I am going to eliminate the anti-steering provision or maybe instead of eliminating it, you still can't add these things on your own. I'm going to see if Apple would go for a mandate of a specific bit of notation within every description, perhaps, that says, hey, Uh, purchases within this app may be available through other means. Check with the developer and publisher uh, on their website or elsewhere uh, to see what makes sense for you or or something along those lines that essentially would go on every app that says, hey, that visual indication, that sticker that says maybe there's another place that you can buy these kinds of things would go in every app. And it might be something that Apple would go for because, again, there is a certain amount of friction there. And if it's on every app, you don't know exactly where and who is offering that lower price. So it would just be kind of a notice provision rather than allowing every developer and every publisher to explain how much better things are outside of the ecosystem that they're otherwise engaged in. But it's a very interesting point of contention of this case because before now, it was unclear that the judge was thinking so hard about these anti-steering provisions. Sean Malenci and Epic Lawyer have returned to the Amex case. You believe that the app store here is like the American Express network in that neither buys nor sells any content, but it facilitates transactions, including a wide range of products. Yes. So the service it sells is matchmaking between developers and consumers. Lawyer asks, and does that have anything to do with the content of the transactions? Yes, but only insofar as it could distinguish between collecting a commission on only certain products. Epic's lawyer is hitting at the fact that Apple requires a commission for digital purchases, but not physical goods sold in apps. And that's an unusual line of argument. It is certainly worth noting that Apple treats what's actually happening on its store differently. But Apple has, in the documentation we've so far seen, presented at least a plausible business reason for that, which is that in physical goods, in things that it doesn't confirm the delivery of, it doesn't have any ability to confirm the delivery of that good, to ensure that that thing has actually changed hands and it doesn't want any part of it. One thing that is skipped in both Epic and Apple's arguments so far is that it's not that Apple allows alternative payment mechanisms for those kinds of physically delivered goods or or services like the Ubers of the world. It prohibits the use of their in-app payment processing and requires a credit card or Apple Pay to go in a different direction for those purposes specifically. So it's not just enlarging the the possibilities, it's specifically prohibiting what it doesn't want any part of on that commission basis because it just doesn't know. And that, to my mind, is a reasonable argument even if you don't agree with it. Remember, the court isn't trying to evaluate whether it's wise or whether there isn't another way you could go possibly. It's trying to evaluate whether you've got a plausible reason and whether or not that reason as it's put into effect is in and of itself anti-competitive. We're talking about Steam and it deciding to lower its commission in Epic Says response to Epic launching a store. Sean Malenci concurs that there's no evidence that platforms on other devices lowered their prices in similar ways. And I like this line of argument from Epic. This is a good little note that Epic makes against this testimony, which is to say, okay, Steam lowered its prices when Epic Store arrived. Nobody else did. And again, remember, Epic's trying to argue that those aren't substitutes to the mobile ecosystem. Those aren't substitutes, the PC isn't, to playing Fortnite. And it's worth noting that when Epic Game Store came in, the people that were clearly seen as competitors, that saw Epic Game Store as competitors, responded when they can argue that the other platforms, your Xboxes, your Nintendos, your Playstations, your iPhones, did not. Calling back to Shamalinsky's defense of Microsoft, he referred to an operating system market in the wake of the case. Shamalinsky says Windows was sold as a specific OS, just bundled with hardware, compared to iOS, Android not being sold in the same way. Lawyer says Android is not free in the sense that it's monetized. There's a price being paid by these OEMs to get Android. It's just paid in a different monetization method. Shamalinsky somewhat derisively calls that a novel theory. And what's amusing about this, right, is if you really break this down, they're saying, okay, if you just give Android for free and then take a cut of your mandated Google Play Store, you're still getting paid in some respect. And I can't help but look at this and think, if there's anybody that knows that free to play ain't free to play, it's probably Epic Games and their Fortnite product, right? They're getting paid. And really the entire free to play market knows that getting your foot in the door, getting Android on those systems doesn't mean that you're not getting paid. 
So this economist is right to call it a novel theory in respect of OEMs, androids, and operating systems, but it's not a novel theory for a game company that knows that just getting that first taste in the door is often all you need. Uh, we're comparing Windows and Mac OS and iOS and Android now. Windows makes money on Mac OS and iOS make money on hardware. Lawyer says, as for Android, no one really knows how they make money. And then we start arguing over the business models of general purpose computing platforms and consoles. In general, Epic says the fact that Apple makes money off hardware reduces the incentive to treat developers well because it doesn't need them as much as, say, console makers who sell at a loss. But lawyers calls back to an earlier Shamalinsky comment that if Apple was going to price gouge based on its power, it already would have. He suggests that a fear of regulation lawsuits has acted as a check on Apple's behavior. And just to get back to the console versus general computing devices distinction, Shamalinsky doesn't actually yield on this. He effectively says that it doesn't matter. And the further Apple experts will also say that it doesn't matter in this space. You don't have to agree with them, but it is something that they are saying as part of this conversation. And I've lost my place on this one. So lawyer calls back to an earlier Shamalensi comment that if Apple was going to price gouge, it already would have. He suggests that a fear of regulation lawsuit has acted as a check on Apple's behavior is a very interesting and kind of dangerous line of attack for Epic, right? If Apple had actually gone ahead and raised prices, lawyer says, Apple would have lost a talking point about never raising its rates on developers, something Tim Cook has testified about in front of Congress. The suggestion being that Apple didn't raise prices because it could be sued for doing so. But that in and of itself is not really a great argument for Epic, right? We've talked about the fact that just having a monopoly, even if we grant them that they have a monopoly power, doesn't make it illegal. You actually have to use that monopoly power in some way that hurts competition. The Apple case appears to be here. Look, we didn't increase our prices. We didn't make any changes in the fall of last year. So what are you getting us on? And Epic's lawyer's basic only response is if there wasn't a fear of regulation lawsuits, they would have, but... There's a lot of things you can say that you would do if there wasn't a law against it. Certainly my clients would do a certain number of other things with their businesses if there wasn't a law against it. That's the purpose of having lawyers is to comply with the law. And it sounds to me, if you actually break this down, that Epic's lawyer here is acknowledging that they didn't make a change. Lawyer calls back to that earlier statement. If Apple was going to price gouge based on power, it already would have. He suggests that a fear of regulation lawsuits has acted as a check on Apple's behavior, then it's working as intended. Feature, not bug. And that's a dangerous line of attack because you can bring this up and say Epic acknowledges that Apple hasn't abused its power position, even if it has a power position. And so what are we talking about here, Judge? Uh, This, in fact, has barely come up that game consoles uh, have the option of buying physical games that allow someone to choose who they will pay. It hasn't really come up because you still lose on the all digital games argument and you still lose on the fact that the console manufacturers take a cut from the retail arm, even though they have no impact on how that actually functions. You have publisher agreements that give them that cut, even though the publisher is entirely responsible for distributing and pressing and doing all those things physically. So it's really not a great line of attack for the epics of the world. As an aside, Shomalinsky insists there are other browsers available on iOS outside of just Safari and says he'd be surprised if Apple had ever barred them, which really doesn't reflect the reality of iOS. Too long didn't read. You can use other browsers on iOS, but Apple spent years putting significant limits on them and requires them to use its WebKit framework. It's definitely hobbled non-Safari browsers autonomy. And I think that's accurate, that Apple isn't so terribly interested in supporting non-Safari browsers. Not a great argument for Apple to suggest that it is. Judge has a couple of questions, and here we're going to take a pretty decent length aside. First of all, she's asking, as I understand it, why both sides haven't talked more about a duty to deal, basically a rule saying a service can be so essential that companies need access. Or now switching over to Leah Nylon, YGR jumps in with a bombshell. I have the ABA's antitrust law book up here, and I've heard quite a bit of evidence throughout the trial regarding how big Apple is and how anti-competitive it is. I put in my preliminary injunction order with respect to essential facilities. Neither of the parties have any interest in briefing or providing evidence on that topic. It says that, and I think she's reading the ABA book here, essential facilities claims arise in a vertical context when a plaintiff alleges a duty to deal because a facility is so superior, competitors cannot succeed without accessing it. It sounds to me like what Epic is saying is what is we want Apple to allow us to deal on their platform. And there are only two of these platforms. And because there are only two, all these competitors can't succeed without access to these platforms. 
YGR says she hasn't practiced antitrust in 40 years, but why isn't anyone trying to use that doctrine? And we've got answers. But first, we got to look at this preliminary injunction because she says, hey, I asked about this, and she did. It was just in kind of very small type. Now, when Epic originally made its complaint and then asked for a temporary restraining order and then asked for a preliminary injunction, it included this essential facilities doctrine. And we're going to shorten it for purposes here. We're actually also going to look at a Department of Justice document on this topic. But it says basically that something can be so essential to making a business function and owned by one private party that that private party has to agree to deal with its rival slash competitor because to otherwise do so would obliterate competition. So after this portion of the preliminary injunction that we've already read as part of this series talking about aftermarkets, and the judge being unhappy that Apple just kind of ignored it, you get to footnote 17 here. Footnote 17 says, Apple says it's the IP owner, even if it's a monopolist, Apple is not required to allow unfettered and uncompensated use of its intellectually owned technology. Moreover, the judge finishes off, however, the parties failed to brief whether Apple possesses essential facilities, which may require, parenthetical, compensated access. The court makes no express finding on these issues, but notes these as other potential hurdles. Why aren't you talking to me about essential facilities? And the answer to that is that it's a bit of a throwaway. Essential facilities hasn't actually been very successful in the various courts of the United States. I've brought up here a Department of Justice white paper, and this is from, I think it's 2015, so it's a few years back, but it's also during the Obama administration. This isn't, in case you think it might be, just a specific Trump Department of Justice kind of document. This has been kind of the long form look at essential facilities. So let's talk about refusals to deal with rivals. Companies are generally under no antitrust obligation to sell or license their products to or provide their assets for use by another company. Notwithstanding this general principle, courts, including the Supreme Court, have held that under certain circumstances, the antitrust laws require a monopolist to deal with a rival. But there are issues there, kind of rhetorical and philosophical issues. If the monopolist is forced to deal with the rival, the monopolist's incentives to spend the necessary time and resources to innovate may be diminished. And if those incentives to innovate are diminished, consumers are likely harmed in the long run. This is kind of the ongoing battle of antitrust enforcement in general, which is you don't want to make really successful competitors not compete in the future because of what you've decided on a legal background. Looking at the Kodak case, which kind of makes up some of the spine of this current Epic versus Apple case, talking about aftermarkets, it held, the court did, that in the absence of any indication of illegal tying, fraud in the patent and trademark office, or sham litigation, the patent holder may enforce the statutory right to exclude others from making, using, or selling the claimed invention free from liability under the antitrust laws. So there are a number of cases here that the courts look at, the various circuits, the Supreme Court, that talk about potentially being forced to deal with your rival. But one thing that pops up even in the Kodak case, which largely goes in Epic's favor, is that patented technology, such as an iPhone, is even more strongly protected against kind of essential facilities doctrine and deal to, duty to deal than other kinds of things. One of the big wins for duty to deal is essentially skiing tickets on different hills that is essentially just real property ownership. Firms may acquire monopoly power by establishing an infrastructure that renders them uniquely suited to serve their customers. Compelling such firms to share the source of their advantage is in some tension with the underlying purpose of antitrust law, since it may lessen the incentive for the monopolist, the rival, or both to invest in those economically beneficial facilities. Enforced sharing also requires antitrust courts to act as central planners, identifying the proper price, quantity, and other terms of dealing, a role for which they are ill-suited. Moreover, compelling negotiation between competitors may facilitate the supreme evil of antitrust, and that is collusion. And this is in a case, this is actually quoting a case called Trinco, which is really the last time that the courts have looked at this in any great detail, at least at the Supreme Court level. And so you get this analysis from the Department of Justice. And again, this doesn't necessarily limit what a civil action like the one brought by Epic can talk about, but it does run suggestive of why essential facilities is essentially a throw-in because there are these issues. Getting to the essential facilities doctrine specifically, we see this summary from the Department of Justice. The Essentials Facility Doctrine derives from the 1912 United States versus Terminal Railroad Association of St. Louis decision in which the Supreme Court condemned a consortium's combination of railroad facilities 
necessary to carry freight traffic or passengers across the Mississippi River at St. Louis. Although the case involved a joint venture among competitors, lower courts have drawn from Terminal Railroad the essential facilities doctrine, the proposition that the antitrust laws require a single firm in control of a facility essential to its competitors to provide reasonable access to the facility if possible. In MCI, a different case, the Seventh Circuit set forth a leading formulation of the doctrine under which a plaintiff must prove four elements to establish liability and defendant's obligation to provide access. One, control of the essential facility by a monopolist. If the iPhone is an essential facility, it is clearly controlled by Apple. A competitor's inability, practically or reasonably, to duplicate the essential facility. Can Epic build its own phone? Unclear. Seems more likely than building its own skiing hill or train tracks, but still unclear. The denial of the use of the facility to a competitor, we don't have denial here, we have conditional denial, which is a separate kind of analysis and probably also why the parties aren't dealing so heavily in essential facilities doctrine, and the feasibility of providing the facility. Apple can easily provide the facility if it were so inclined to do so. In Aspen Skiing, that's the Skiing Hill case, the Supreme Court's first explicit mention of the Essential Facilities Doctrine, the Tenth Circuit had affirmed liability on multiple grounds, including that theory. The Supreme Court declined to consider the possible relevance of the Essential Facilities. In Trinco, that case that we were quoting earlier, the Supreme Court similarly declined either to recognize or to repudiate the doctrine. Essential Facilities at the Supreme Court, the Supreme Law of the Land, is not acknowledged one way or the other. So bare minimum, it's a risky doctrine to bring. And at worst, it's one that the Supreme Court seems at least partially hostile to in electing to decide both of these major decisions on different grounds. More basically, commenters point out that the concerns about innovation incentives and judicial capacity arising in refusal to deal cases apply equally in essential facility cases. The department agrees that the essential facilities doctrine is a flawed means of deciding whether a unilateral, unconditional refusal to deal harms competition. The department believes that there is a significant risk of long-run harm to consumers from antitrust intervention against unilateral unconditional refusals to deal with rivals, particularly considering the effects of economy-wide disincentives and remedial difficulties. In essence, the Department of Justice would say, don't bring your Sherman Antitrust Act case under an essential facilities doctrine. And yet, the Department of Justice ain't deciding this case. So the fact that the judge has asked about this specifically is going to have lawyers at Apple and Epic scrambling to try to address this for the court, probably with some of the things you see here, certainly some of the language that is found in Trinco as to why it doesn't apply and why, in general, making a successful phone product is both available to Epic and not an essential facility in the same manner that it was described in with respect to things like train tracks. But it certainly is a swerve, and we will see how it goes. Our next expert witness is stepping up. Francine LaFontaine, called by Apple. LaFontaine was formerly the director of the FTC's Bureau of Economics. LaFontaine is here to talk about the issue of what consumers, including developers in this case, could substitute in the markets being discussed here. And yes, including developers is true. As we talked about, developers are a kind of customer to Apple, but Consumer welfare, the end user state, is the high point, the summit, the peak of antitrust enforcement. And the law is always very careful and the courts are very careful to not advantage competitors instead of competition, with consumer welfare really being the stand-in for what, quote unquote, the concept of competition is in the real world. LaFontaine is asked to describe the criteria for judging substitutability. She uses the example of a pair of shoes, high heels versus flat shoes. Are those substitutes for each other? It depends on what the consumer need is. LaFontaine also takes on Evan's conclusions from yesterday, says his definitions are both too broad and too narrow, i.e. it focuses only on one platform consumers can go to, and it covers categories of apps that shouldn't be classed together. So too narrow and then too broad. Talking now about a case she dealt with at the FTC, a proposed merger of Staples and Office Depot. The FTC determined the same set of professionals went to both stores for the same set of office supply products, and this market wouldn't be competitive if they merged. But it found a separate, more competitive market for ink and toner, where there were more options to buy. LaFontaine similarly distinguishes the non-gaming mobile app market, which might be a part of a duopoly, from the specific market for games, where she says there are more competitive options. And then Ms. Robertson at The Verge says, this is one reason why we sat through all those days talking about whether Fortnite was a game or not. Somewhat. 
She gives another example as flower bouquets in a supermarket. A supermarket might monopolize the food market, but you can specifically buy flowers lots of other places and not just at supermarkets in general, and it's not monopolizing that. Gives a similar analogy involving liquor and liquor stores, hence the thumbnail. Long last, even if a liquor store sold crackers, it wouldn't become a grocery store because people primarily go there to buy liquor. Said another way, you can have a monopoly on certain things and not a monopoly on other things. At least that was the case in the Federal Trade Commission's jurisprudence and what it was deciding to make hay about with respect to mergers. We're back in session after a break with LaFontaine. We're still talking about the liquor analogy. Apple's lawyer asks if the Epic Game Store adding Spotify and other non-gaming apps makes it something other than a game store. Spotify being the crackers in this scenario. The Epic Game Store is still mostly from the consumer's perspective like the liquor store, a place that would they would think of to go for games, LaFontaine says. Games in this scenario are liquor. As a side note, if you want people to think that you're broader than games, probably don't have games in the title of your store. And I know that games isn't necessarily in the title of the store because your company's name is Epic Games, but that just kind of is a recursive problem. Okay, now your company is named Games and you run a store named Games. If you want to claim that it's broader so that you can bring a monopoly action against a third-party business partner, you might have a naming problem just based on this analogy uh, that Ms. LaFontaine is bringing up here. We're going to now talk about the for-market, after-market framework that Evans proposed separating buying an app versus in-app purchases. LaFontaine reiterates an argument from earlier in the day saying what Apple does is essentially run one unified matchmaking market. Again, as he said, epic, multiple markets, Apple, one thing, you're buying an iPhone. LaFontaine also says that even if there was a distinction between the two markets, it wouldn't necessarily be anti-competitive for Apple to tie both together because they have their own potential consumer base. Not a great argument, but it's not really an argument. It's kind of a throwaway line in any event. Epic's up now, starting by pushing back on LaFontaine for relying on economic analysis done by other people. She says that's consistent with how she'd work at an agency like the FTC. Indeed, it is consistent with how the government agencies work. Doesn't make it super effective for this purpose. And also note that the complaints that Apple had about Epic's experts yesterday were in large part around the fact that they hadn't looked at the direct materials necessary to make a claim. So Epic's kind of throwing it back in their face. Makes sense. Lawyer and LaFontaine are engaged in a back and forth about the granularity of the product market she's analyzing. She groups together a category of game transactions, and Epic has built its case on wanting the judge to examine a broader app market. Lawyer asks if when she did her analysis, you were not aware of all the different kinds of apps that Epic develops? LaFontaine says she was not fully aware, and that includes her not knowing about House Party, a social app Epic acquired in 2019. Had you known that Epic was the developer of a social networking app, would she have reevaluated her market definition? I would have considered what it means, yes. And so we get into these arguments with LaFontaine, just like Apple did with Epic, about the right definition of the relevant market. Epic says the market we're talking about is not just games because Epic does some other things with its store and would provide those other things through an Epic game store. But is that enough? I don't have a good answer to that. Certainly Epic is more associated with games than anything else, but Epic's made a pretty good point that Epic does make other products or make other products available as well. Lawyer then cites this paragraph, objects to the bit about steering, notes that Apple doesn't in fact let developers tell users about cheaper options on other platforms, but that's not actually what this piece of her written testimony says. She says, meanwhile, developers are not locked in either. Nothing in Apple's license restricts developers from offering transactions on other platforms. That's true. Or quote unquote, steering consumers to other platforms. Question, that's what the lawyer's arguing about. By charging less on these platforms or more on the app store. That's important. When she says steering here, she's not talking about messages. She's talking about you can greatly change your prices in various capacities and make it clear that you should be looking at my web browser first. You should be looking at this avenue first. And in fact, when the Epic Game Store started and said, we're only gonna charge developers 12%, not 30%, one of the things I thought would happen would be a contractual commitment from Epic with these new developers, rather than exclusives that said, make it so that your prices are 18% less. You'll still be making the same amount of money, but we're gonna get the volume up here 
And we're going to get people's behavior to change so that they know if there's a game out, the first place they should check is the Epic Game Store because the prices are lower. And if you want to split the baby and not make it 18%, make it 9%, make it 10% probably for a whole number. And once people realize they save five bucks going to Epic Game Store every time, then you've changed that behavior. You've quote unquote steered people into checking whether it's available on our storefront first. They didn't go that direction. And that's the direction I would have gone at. You can go and check my videos when Epic Game Store is announced to see that that's what I would have done. But that is, in fact, steering and the lawyer is being a little bit granular himself or herself in asking the question on this particular score. Finally, we have a fourth witness, Lauren Hitt. And this person uh, is going to say a few things that I think are useful to Apple, but aren't really going to get to the end state because we don't have cross-examination. Hit analyzed the competitive effects of Apple's policies and pricing. He concluded there's no evidence based on those metrics that Apple engaged in anti-competitive conduct. Apple lawyer notes that Apple and Epic have different definitions of whether this should be a case about apps in general or just games. Hit says that the difference wouldn't broadly change his conclusions. We're still talking about 30%. We're still not seeing Apple change what it did. And this kind of highlights what we've talked about in prior videos in this series that Epic's theory of the case is that Apple didn't have to change. The world changed around it. And that made what Apple was doing before that was perfectly legal, then suddenly illegal. And that's always going to be a tough philosophy to bring because Apple can sit there and say, we didn't change anything. And that the changing of the market, which you can't even define without confusing everybody in the room, shouldn't change what we're allowed to do. The number of game transactions has been increasing over time. Game transactions have expanded 1,200% from the inception till 2018. Revenue expanded 2,600% around the same period. These are enormous changes. And the Apple argument here is effectively, if these people are so upset, if we are monopolists, if we are horrible folks, then everybody shouldn't be joining this market. This is increased in size. This isn't demonstrative of people trapped in our ecosystem. This is people flocking to it because of the services and the platform we provide. Now, obviously, Epic can look at these numbers and say, well, you're making a lot more money than you are in terms of growth. And yes, you're a monopolist who has all these evil policies so the people felt they had to come here. Epic's documentation and its original complaint is effectively, Apple's audience is too big to ignore. We have to sign up with whatever they say. And that makes them anti-competitive and somebody that should be looked at as an illegal market actor. Has Apple reduced its commission over time? The lawyer asks. Yes, says Hit. App Store started at 30% commission for purchases and in-app purchase, but in 2016, Apple reduced subscription renewal rates and added the video partner program discount. He also points out the small business developer program, but that doesn't go very far because the lawyer and the judge asked whether that was uh, related to the Epic lawsuit and the witness has to admit that they don't know. And in all honesty, it probably was. Hit Proceed says whether hardware sells at a loss is irrelevant to whether the platform should charge a specific commission. There are platforms that subsidize hardware. They charge 30%. There are platforms that don't subsidize hardware. They charge 30%. Hit cites Valve as an example of a platform that doesn't have any kind of hardware, but charges 30%. It did drop its rates for big sellers on its platform. But if the argument is that business model matters, then Steam should probably be one of the first places you look. And I think that's a pretty effective line of attack. And that's it for the day. We're going to still be working on HIT during the next video here, but you can see the battle of the economists is getting interesting. What do you think in terms of the reality described? Do you think Epic's got a better handle on it with the multiple market theory? Do you think Apple's got a better handle on it with effectively folks buying one unified product? I'd be very interested to see what you have to say. And if you enjoy these videos, please consider supporting the channel. We've got a Patreon, Streamlabs, a store, or just subscribing, ringing the bell, upvotes, downvotes, comments and telling your friends. Every little bit helps. If you saw this on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And if you listen to it as a podcast, thank you so much for listening. And I will catch you on the very next episode of Virtual Legality. Virtual Legality is a YouTube video series with audio podcast versions presented as commentary and for education and entertainment purposes only. It does not constitute legal advice and does not create an attorney-client relationship. If you have legal questions about the topics discussed, please consult your own legal counsel.